I was honestly pretty surprised when I learned that the Barbarian was getting sent back out for another round of UA. Not that I was upset about it or anything, but the Barbarian that we saw in UA7 felt like it was generally in a pretty good place, with the exception of the one big miss that I called out in my previous video on the class, and that being Brutal Critical. For those who may not be caught up, the issue that I and many others took with the Brutal Critical feature took a few different forms. Firstly, the feature is largely uncompetitive with what other classes are getting at mid to high levels of play, which in itself is something of a microcosm for the whole multi-classing discussion that I've went into in another video. I'll leave that linked in the description and the end cards, but essentially the idea is just that if the team wants to provide some incentive for a player to stick with a single class throughout an entire campaign, the later level features have to actually be compelling and not just derivative versions of themselves. There's a lot more to that discussion though, so check out my video about the topic if you haven't already. Brutal Critical in its current form was really something of a nothing burger feature. Sure, it lets you roll some extra d12s, which is always super fun, but for the entirety of your 9th, 13th, and 17th level features to be taken up by just a singular additional die feels underwhelming at best. Yes, it does have some nice synergy with Reckless Attack, but it's still woefully unreliable. Early on in the UA process, the team talked at length about removing features they dubbed as Mother May I features, which are abilities that your character technically has available to them, but the use of them actually requires the involvement of your DM for either approval or clarity. Brutal Critical though was kind of like a Mother May I Possibly Have the Chance to feature, since no matter how badly you might want to use it, there's a chance that you just don't crit at all or often enough to feel like it's delivering any value to you as a player. Fortunately, it really feels like the team listened to the community on this UA, as not only did the Monk make an epic Uno Reverso, but Brutal Critical was actually directly addressed in a pretty reasonable way, even if it's still a little bit confusing. I just want to thank everyone for all the support on my Monk video, it has been unbelievable. But if you want to help me reach that goal of 5,000 subscribers by the end of the year, a sub to the channel would mean so, so much. Thank you. First and foremost, the feature has been renamed. It's now called Brutal Strike, and definitely takes a page out of the much lauded UA6 Rogue's new feature, Cunning Strike and Devious Strike. As an aside, this is actually a bit of a nice design language consistency that is nice to see. While I'm sure that it's not always the case, it seems that the design team is using the word strike in features where there are choices involved. Cunning and Devious Strike being the first and most obvious examples, Brutal Strike as we will soon see, but even the UA6 Cleric's Blessed Strikes allows you to choose between Divine Strike and Potent Spellcasting. And while we're at it, Unarmed Strikes lets you choose between Damage, Grappling, and Shoving. Maybe I'm reading just a little bit too much into this, but if I'm not, it's a nice bit of attention to detail. What the new Brutal Strike feature allows you to do is, if you used Reckless Attack, you can forgo the advantage that it gave you to instead deal an additional 1d10 damage of the type dealt by the weapon or the unarmed strike that you hit with and apply an additional effect. Before we talk about those additional effects though, there's actually a lot that we need to discuss first. It's also worth noting that Brutal Strike only works with strength-based attacks, so most ranged attacks outside of thrown weapons do not work with the feature. Secondly, there is a ton of ambiguity in the wording. <laughs> It's initially unclear if Brutal Strike applies to each attack separately, as in you can decide for each attack whether you want to forgo the advantage or use your Brutal Strike features. As far as I know, as of the time of writing, there hasn't been any direct confirmation of this in either direction, but my interpretation is that it works only on the first attack and on none of the subsequent ones. The specific wording of, if you use Reckless Attack, you can forgo advantage on the next attack roll you make on your turn, seems to suggest that you can only use Brutal Strike with the first attack, and that would be my guess given the wording. But there's definitely an argument to be made that you can just as easily decide with each attack roll whether to use Brutal Strike, and are therefore always foregoing advantage on your next attack roll. This definitely fits with the wording too, but honestly it's really unclear. I would love for you to be able to make the decision on each attack roll. I feel that would make the feature much more interesting, but maybe it would also be too good? I'm really not sure. The second bit of ambiguity that could use some clarification is whether or not you're sacrificing any and all advantage provided to you or only the advantage given to you by reckless attack. The wording in the text actually seems reasonably clear in that they are using two separate modifiers. Firstly, it says if you use reckless attack. Cool, that's statement one, no problem. Statement two is that you, quote, forgo advantage on the next attack roll. This seems pretty clear that you are simply losing any advantage that you had, regardless of its source. Where the confusion comes from is in the overview video where Jeremy Crawford explicitly states that you sacrifice the advantage that it gave you. It, in this case, being reckless attack. 
Meaning that if you lose the advantage that Reckless Attack gave you, if you had some other way of gaining advantage on the attack roll, then you could still benefit from both advantage on the attack and the additional damage and the effect of Brutal Strike. It's important to remember that using the feature isn't imposing disadvantage, so there isn't really any question of anything cancelling out. You just sacrifice that source of advantage. While it is absolutely unclear, my interpretation and what I believe the intention was is that you are sacrificing any and all sources of advantage to gain the extra damage and effect from Brutal Strike. I think that's the most likely understanding of the wording used in the feature, even if it conflicts with what Jeremy Crawford said. So with all that weird stuff out of the way, we can finally talk about the additional effects. Forceful Blow allows you to push the target 15 feet straight away from you, and then allows you to move an amount equal to half your speed straight toward the target without provoking opportunity attacks. Hamstring Blow reduces the speed of the target by 15 feet until the start of your next turn. While I don't think either of these options are necessarily mind-blowing, they are at least interesting and provide two different ways of largely accomplishing the same thing that being Battlefield Control. On some level, I feel like the use of Brutal Strike was limited to the first attack only, so you can't just chain forceful blows together and move like 80 feet in a single round without the use of the dash action. That said, it is still incredibly effective for Barbarian's mobility. At 13th level, you get two new Brutal Strike options. Staggering Blow, which gives the target disadvantage on its next saving throw, and makes it so that the creature can't make opportunity attacks until the start of your next turn. It's kind of like granting your entire party the disengage action for one specific creature. And Sundering Blow, which grants the next attack roll made against the target by another creature a bonus to the roll equal to your rage damage, which at 13th level is plus 3. This is fine, I guess. I think it's a neat idea to utilize the rage damage bonus in a bit of a unique way, and it's something that we've seen a couple times now within this version of the Barbarian. But I can't help but feel like your party is just always going to be asking you to remind them what your rage bonus is. It's just not all that commonly used, so it feels a little bit awkward to hamstring it in there. That being said though, I do like the consistency of getting a solid number, but I wonder if it would have just made more sense for it to provide advantage, but I guess this can stack with another source of advantage, so yeah, maybe it's alright. At 17th level, Brutal Strike improves again, this time though you don't get any new options, but rather the damage bonus increases to 2d10, and you can use two of your Brutal Strike options on each hit, which is admittedly pretty rad. It's also worth noting that these do stack with your weapon masteries, which can make for some wild wombo combos. Overall, I think Brutal Strike is good. It feels way less chaotic than Brutal Critical did, and I'll admit it, even though I didn't like it from a design perspective, Brutal Critical was still a super fun feature to use when you got to use it. It's really not hard to feel though, like the consistency and versatility that the new Brutal Strike options bring aren't just much healthier for the class overall though. I don't think they've blown me away here, and I'm not sure that this is going to convince many players to play a Barbarian all the way through to the higher levels, but I really do like where they're trending. The next feature that we need to discuss is the change made to the 15th level feature Persistent Rage, as well as Rage overall, which also leads to another long-winded discussion. <laughs> The new version of Persistent Rage is literal music to my ears. Now, when you roll initiative, you regain all uses of Rage, once per long rest. Additionally, it makes it so your Rage lasts for 10 minutes, or until you gain the unconscious or incapacitated condition. The incapacitated part was a new inclusion here. But oh man, it feels like my crusade to remove the ridiculous regain X resources if you have none remaining features has finally paid off. I'm just gonna go ahead and take full responsibility for this. No need to thank me though. What's interesting about this change though is that it comes at the same time that the design team also made it so that a barbarian regains one expended use of their rage on a short rest. So now I kind of feel conflicted. Hear me out. Rage has always felt the least resourcey to me. I get why it's there though. They didn't want you to effectively just always be in rage mode, which would practically nullify any reason to not be raging. But it's always just felt like enough. I've talked about this in other videos, but the way that it seems that most people run their games is not exactly how the design team envisioned. In the Dungeon Master's Guide, it suggests that parties can handle 6 to 8 medium or hard encounters per day. Now, yes, that isn't exclusive to combat encounters, but I would be pretty hard pressed to believe that most campaigns are actually doing that, especially given the trend in recent years toward a more narrative and story driven focus. If you're running 8 encounters per adventuring day, sure, the 2 rages that you get from your first 2 levels, or even the 3 up to 5th level, can probably actually feel like a challenge to manage. But if you're only running 2 or 3 encounters per day, well, there's not really anything to manage here. Rage is weird because it's kind of like a once per encounter resource most of the time. While yes, you totally could drop your rage in 5th edition, it really wasn't all that common. I've had a barbarian player in my party for 3.5 years now, and I can probably count on one hand the amount of times that his rage has been dropped. 
But now in 1D&D, with barbarians having the ability to just decide to just keep being angry as a bonus action, the resource feels even more like an encounter-wide one than ever before. This is definitely in contrast to a class like Monk, who can easily burn through all of their discipline points in one or two encounters, which makes resource management for them much more of a challenge. I feel like Wizards of the Coast is kind of like the Principal Skinner meme here. It's not me who's out of touch, it's the players who are out of touch. <laughs> I would genuinely love to know if they've done research and determined that most games are actually running 6-8 to eight encounters per adventuring day, and if that's the case, I'll gladly take the L on this one. But I really don't think that that is the case. Maybe I'll make a whole video about this one day, but I can't help but feel like the design team's concept of the adventuring day probably needs to evolve to meet players where they are and not where they want them to be. I'm also just gonna say right here that yes, I know there are people running eight encounters per day. Yes, I know that number isn't just combat. And yes, I know you're also a better DM than me. Anyway, the whole point of this meandering ramble was to say that Rage almost feels like a superfluous resource at this point, though it's also necessary. You basically always have enough since you're more than likely only using one per encounter, and you probably aren't running eight encounters per day. Now you get one back on the short rest, and you can decide to keep your rage going as a bonus action, and Persistent Rage gives them all back to you, it almost makes me question if the team should revisit rage as a concept, but that's obviously not going to be happening for 1 and d I know they did do this to some extent, the new Primal Knowledge feature provides a use for rage outside of combat, which is really cool, so maybe the team expects barbarians to be using that a lot? Maybe? I, I really don't know yet. If so, and they are using it a lot, that is a big win and goes to demonstrate some really solid foresight on the designer's behalf. Knowing that you have easier ways to get your rage back will make a player much more likely to use Primal Knowledge rather than just save their rages exclusively for combat. The last thing that I wanted to touch on are the changes to the Path of the World Tree, the new subclass for a Barbarian. I don't have a lot to say since I think the subclass was already pretty fun and in a reasonably good place, but the changes definitely make it feel much more functional. Firstly, the third level feature, Vitality of the Tree, now grants the Barbarian temporary hit points rather than healing them, which I think is a much better idea and feels much more cohesive. The sixth level feature, Branches of the Tree, also feels much better all around. It now lets you plan it out a little bit better since it activates at the start of a creature's turn rather than at the end of it, so it allows you to set it up much more consistently, and the range has also been increased from 20 to 30 feet. Now, also, in addition to being able to pull the target toward you, you can also reduce their speed to zero until the end of their current turn, preventing it from moving at all, which can also be really significant. Battering Roots, the 10th level feature, received some clarifications. Firstly, the extended reach provided to your weapon only lasts during the turn and not just forever anymore. Secondly, it also only applies to melee weapons with the heavy or versatile properties. In addition, you can activate the push or topple masteries in addition to any other mastery that you would be using. This feels right. Yes, it might be a little bit more restrictive in what you can really do, but I think the restrictions feel reasonable and appropriate, and still provide great power and flexibility to the subclass. Lastly, the 14th level feature, Travel Along the Tree, has been completely redesigned and isn't largely useless anymore. The feature now lets you, when you activate your rage, or as a bonus action while it's active, to teleport up to 60 feet. It's basically better Misty Step which is already a crazy spell. But it also lets you bring another creature with you, and you can actually choose up to six creatures within 10 feet of you. If you do that, the teleport distance increases to 500 feet, which is basically a free dimension door, but does come at 14th level, but it's also pretty amazing. This makes your Path of the World Tree Barbarian probably your best we've got a huge mistake contingency plan. Overall, I really do like the changes to the Barbarian and the Path of the World Tree. Even if I don't think they're revolutionary and dramatically changing the game, I do feel like they just made the class feel so much more well-rounded and cohesive as a whole. Everything is obviously still subject to change, as there will certainly be more tweaks between now and the final publication, but I don't feel like they've got such a brutal problem anymore. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing to help me reach that goal of 5,000 subs by the end of the year. Check out some of my other 1D&D videos, but otherwise, take care.